Thank you, Stephen. Amazing, always. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you for all being here on this beautiful day in our Father's house on Father's Day. How many fathers do we have here? Raise hands. Fantastic. Obviously, we can't all be fathers. It takes two to become parents. Uh, anyway, uh, we, we are glad you're here and welcome to all those who are online and uh, Plymouth Village TV and YouTube and such, but we are glad you are all here. Um, protocols on the back of your order of worship is all the stuff about COVID. If you've had your vaccines and been proved, proven to have had it, them, then you don't have to wear a mask, but, or you could, but if you haven't, then you need to wear it, please, and covering your nose and mouth. And uh, if you can't fill out the attendance card today, sometimes during the service and turn that in at the end. And uh, that will help us keep track of who is here. Uh, if you need any help, the ushers are here uh, to help us today. So restroom or whatever else. So welcome on this Father's Day in our Father's house. Let us join together him three, six, seven. Yes, please stand and join us singing that hymn. Please join me in reading the words of witness that are found in your order of worship. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, goodness, and love, and in Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord and Savior, who for us and our salvation lives and died and rose again and lives evermore, and in the Holy Spirit who takes the things of Christ and reveals them to us renewing 
comforting and inspiring our souls. We are united in striving to know the will of God as taught in the Holy Scriptures and in our purpose to walk in the ways of the Lord made known or to be made known to us. Amen. seated. Uh, if there's anyone that has an announcement to make, now is the time to come forward, please. All right, one at a time, not too many. Okay, in the life of our church, uh, offerings, we normally would pass the plate during the service, but we can't do that yet, hopefully soon. And so uh, we do have ongoing expenses. You can make them one of these three ways, online or a gift. Uh, by mail or drop it off at the office. Um, deacons have provided a beautiful brochure. Are, do we have any first time visitors today? Then I guess we don't get to hand any out. They are pretty. John has a nice message on here. Um, Bible study, we're always looking for people that want to let, come together in Bible study. And um, it's uh, something I highly recommend. We get a lot out of it from our group including lasagna, so it, it kind of works. It's almost a Presbyterian thing, I think. Uh, and under the sea program, thank you, Julie, I've got it on my phone, I actually brought it up. Uh, this summer, July 18th to the 22nd, is a week-long fine arts experience. Vocal music, movement and choreography, painting, crafts, and more. 8.30 to 12 daily, performance will be on uh, July the 26th, the 22nd at 6 p.m. It's $50 for the week. There are, there are scholarships available. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me, call the church office and make arrangements. And I believe Jennifer has something to do with that. Yes, that smile tells me yes. Okay, any other announcements? Then it's time for special music. And you are in for a treat. I heard the rehearsal.
when we truly see how deep our weakness goes. His strength in us begins when ours comes to an end. He hears our humble cry and proves again. His strength is perfect when our strength is gone. He'll carry Thank you, Bruce and Stephen. Let us join together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of this Father's Day and every day for you are our Father eternally. In our daily lives, we are confronted with the challenges that seem insurmountable and beyond our capabilities to solve. The war in Ukraine, murders of children, drugs, violence, homelessness, increasing divisiveness within our land, poverty, famines, all leave us overwhelmed and feeling helpless. Yet as we pray in our Father's house, we know that you alone are our Savior. You have given us the greatest gift of all eternity, the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, our Redeemer. Help us to always remember, not just on a day on the calendar that is called Father's Day, but always that you are our Father who gave us your Son to be our Savior from the sins of this world. <clears throat> we pray, Lord, for the young people at Youth Hope that are struggling in so many ways. Lack of acceptance, loneliness, depression, suicidal thoughts, and drug addiction make every day a struggle for survival. We pray that we can bring them to see that they have a Father in you, Lord, who will always be there for them, a Father that oftentimes they never had. So on this Father's Day in our Father's house, let us lift up our voices to you, Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts 
as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. What an inspiration all this music has been this morning. It's really been terrific. Thank you so much. Following a series of uh, sermons uh, Pastor John has given us uh, on the six chapters of Galatians, I was interested to see what his new topic would be this morning and was uh, looking forward to my assignment. And I find out we're in the New Testament and we're in Genesis on page 17. It's starting with chapter 12. Um, I uh, am naturally a little nervous. Am I going to have to read some of these biblical place names in the Old Testament? 
And so I gave it a good looking over, and there were three that I thought that I might have a little trouble with. So um, I remembered what uh, Pastor John had said in his notice in the Tower of Tidings this week. One of the comments was he said that he was delighted in what I can get a computer to do. So I put in the Google line, pronounce H-A-R-R-A-N in the Bible. And I, you have to be very specific and not give it too much to think about. So um, several choices came up, and it's very easy. You punched on one, and this low British voice came on. It says, Haran. And then there's this pause, and it said, if you're American, it's Heron. So I'm going to try and do that one. The second one I thought I knew for sure. I have always said Shechem, and the, uh, the computer told me it's Shechem. And the third one was really hard. It's the, near the end of the whole passage. It's spelled, the city that uh, God is directing Abraham to go is spelled capital A-I. So I found out that it's a-E is how you pronounce it. And I noticed that mostly the pronunciation goes on the first syllable in all these cities. So here we go. We'll try at it. And we're in the 12th chapter and verse 1. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. And I want to interrupt again because I went into the King James Version and it said, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred. And he removed from thence. So I just think the words are so interesting how we change over the years. And it continues in chapter, uh, verse 2. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah <clears throat> at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and A.E. on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and con continued toward the Negev. May God add his blessing to our understanding and inspiration of his holy word. Well, uh, I just learned that I completely mispronounced the names next door at Restoration of those important <laughs> villages. So, <laughs> Ganilda with her journalism background, again, facts matter. So, appreciate that. I'll, I'll, I'll write that next week. So, if you're going to make a list of the 10 most important people to our faith, you'd have Jesus, you'd have Peter, Paul, and Mary, the... Uh, <laughs> Right. The people, not the bands, the people, the actual historical people. Uh, Abraham would, would be on that list. And the fact that when I think about my faith, when I think about my Christian roots in faith, I don't naturally think of Abraham as being on that list. Uh, I'm also aware of how odd it is to rank biblical people. I, I don't think Jesus would, would, would be too keen on that, but he, he would be number one, of course, but Abraham would be on that list. And the fact that I don't think and see him as one of the most important influencers of my Christian faith means that I forget the Jewish roots of my faith. I'm a, Easter, I'm a Western practitioner of an Eastern faith. Um, and as we go through this series on, on the life of Abraham this summer, it's important to remember 
And part of what I want to do in this series is remind us that Abraham is our father. In the book of Galatians, we, we saw Paul say that explicitly, that we are spiritual children of Abraham. Our Jewish brothers and sisters are biologically linked to Abraham, but through Christ making us one, we are ones, well, the, the image Paul uses is of grafting. You know grafting? I, I imagine at a church like FCC, and I'm constantly struck by the diverse talent in this church. I'm sure some of you have, have, have grafted. I, I've seen images of people who grafted an in, in orange branch and a pear branch onto an apple tree. And so it draws strength and nourishments from the ground and will produce pears and, and then later produce oranges and then apples. That's probably the wrong order. I don't really know what I'm talking about. I just know, I just know that, that grafting uh, has happened. And, and the image Paul uses it, you know, of course, of the, of the Jewish tradition is of an olive tree. If you think of an olive tree, there's, there's many distinctives about this tree that we've been grafted onto. Olive trees are resilient. They're tough. They outlast and outlive other trees uh, all through history. The olive branch has symbolized peace. And Paul says we're grafted on to that tree. The, the promises made to Abraham, the story of God's redemption of all through human history. Paul says that's our story. We are Abraham's children through faith. We draw our strength from our Jewish roots. Paul says that we are spiritual heirs of Abraham and live under and in the promises of made to us. We don't replace Israel. We're not the new Israel. We are grafted on to, the, to Israel's story. So in this passage, we remember that we are children of Abraham. That when God makes a promise to bless the world through him and through his offspring, we inherit those promises. And although we have no biological connection, Paul says, we are connected through adoption. Now, a little bit of context. What is, how have things been going in Genesis, we'll say three through 11, this kind of the fall, life after the fall, have things been going pretty well? Hmm, I'd say no, not at all. You know, Genesis 11 is the story of Babel, it's a story of a new technology that civilization has created, the brick. The brick created all kinds of new possibilities with architecture. Before, it was just built on hewn stones, and stones are stubborn things, and they are shaped in, in random ways, and, but brick is uniform in size and shape and created new possibilities to build. And, and of course, humankind saw that what they'd created and said, Let's make a great name for ourselves. And God saw what they were doing and confused their language and they spread out and became different tribes and, and different nations. And there's a movement in the first, we'll say chapters three through eight of Genesis. It's a movement east, east of Eden a steady march away from God's original plan and intention from humankind, from Cain reaching out to strike his brother Abel down to humankind becoming so corrupt and evil and self-destructive that the flood, God sent the flood to Babel now, to all of humankind joining together to make their name great. And then God intervenes. God enters in to history and tells Abraham, I will make your name great. This is a movement away from Babel where the Babylonians said, let us make our name great together. God calls Abraham and says, I will make your name great and I will move you west. All of human history had been moving east, away from Eden, away from God's intention, God's good plan, but then God steps in and says, go west, young man. Except he's not so young, he's 75. 
No, actually, 75 is quite young. I apologize for that mis mistake. Yes, 75 is, is the new 50. Anyway, so <laughs> how do you think Abram received this news? What would it have been like for Abram to be going about his day when suddenly God speaks to him? And I say God because we, we know a little bit more than the story than he does, but he would not have thought God. He would have thought a God had spoken to him because Abraham was pagan. Let me tell you what I mean by that because that might be a little bit shocking. Remember when Pastor John said Abraham was pagan? Well, technically, let me make my case for it and you decide if I'm right or wrong. This is what I mean by pagan. Pagan, pagan. Paganism is the belief that there are many gods that have dominion and authority over particular plots of land. And what we must do as those who live under the authority of local deities is to make sure that we keep them properly appeased. When the gods are happy, crops grow. The earth produces. When the gods are happy, children are born safely. There's protection from disease. The gods bring rain in season, make sure the winters aren't too cold to ruin the crops, make them, make them produce like they've never produced before. Health, nothing to fear at night. All is well when the gods are happy. But when the gods are angry, there's drought. There's pandemics, there's sickness without cure. Enemies sweep in, raid storehouses. The gods must be kept happy through sacrifice and rituals. Our future is tied to the whims of the gods and whether or not they are happy for us. And, and since we, it can be very confusing, we don't know what we did, why are the gods angry at us? What do we have to do to, to, to make things right again? Well, every tribe, every, every plot of land had a shaman. And the shaman would step forward and say, I have spoken with the gods and I know why they're angry, they're displeased, and, and then that's where scapegoating happens and um, witch trials and all these other things. And, and what, what tends to happen in paganism and what happened all around Abram was child sacrifice because you just never knew why the gods were angry. You never knew what had gone wrong. You didn't know how to prove your loyalty and faithfulness to them, and, and the, the sacrifices demanded more and more, and there's this escalating cycle that climaxed with the sacrifice of children. Maybe one of the blood of our own will appease the gods. Part of what we'll learn, because God revealed it to us, is that God will never demand that. It's part of the Isaac story, but I get ahead of myself. Um, the world Abraham grew up in was a world of local deities. And so when he, re when he hears from a God, I mean, it was his first time hearing from God, but he, I'm sure, had heard accounts of other people who testified that, that deities had reached out to them and thus saith God and, and all that. And, and so when he interacts with God, he assumes, well, I should listen and obey. It's a little weird that this God wants me to leave and go because usually gods are tribal and, and they're territorial and, and to leave this territory and to leave my ancestors and the, God, and the gods of my ancestors behind, unusual, but he goes. He believed God. He believed the promises that were made and had enough faith in the little he knew about God to, to pack up his things and, and to head west and to believe that this God who had spoken to him would indeed follow through in his promises. And he'd made some pretty big promises, you know? Promise number one, I'll, I'll make your name great. I'll make you a great nation. Uh, I, anybody blesses you, I'll bless them. Anyone curses you, they'll be cursed. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you in order to bless the whole world. God comes blessing. God comes showing his favor. God comes to make 
into and form in Abraham a people that would bless the world, not conquer it through violence and conquest, but would bless all the world. And God, God's blessing is both personal and cosmic. It is to Abram and Sarai, as we will see as the story unfolds, that the blessing includes them and, and their desires to, to have a child and their desires to, to live a rich, full life. God honors that. But God honors it with a greater purpose in mind. In fact, a cosmic purpose in mind. Abram did not yet know that this God who made the promise to him was the God of the whole earth, not some local tribal deity. He is the God who sends rain to the wicked and, and, and to the righteous, God, the God who created all the beauty and goodness of our world, and he has chosen to enter history to bless one family, one person, in order to save all of us. What we learn about God, a couple things in this passage. And I always say I'm going to do a biography, but I always find that every biography ultimately is about God. So I'm gonna, if it's all right with you, I'm going to talk a lot about God through this series. Okay, hearing no, hearing no pushback, I'm going to continue forward with this as planned. So what we learn about God is that he keeps his promises and that he keeps his promises to restore all of creation back to himself. We had Eden, and we had Adam and Eve moving east of Eden. We had Cain killing Abel and being sent even further to the east. We have them reaching further and further east to build a great name for themselves. And then God intervenes. And how does God intervene? Does he show himself and boom out with this mighty voice, I am the God, the creator God, all these local deities you worship are of your own imagination, you're being exploited by those shaman who claim to speak of God but are only looking for their own. No, how does he do it? An old man, sorry. A man who is neither young nor old. Just a, just, we'll, just, we'll just say a man and a woman who are past what traditionally is defined as the childbearing years. That, that this is his plan, to find one man, one woman, and through them, slowly, over time, turn the wheel of history, the stop, the downward spiral of destruction, the violence, and turn two people west, and to begin to do something new. God will not abandon his good world, but God will not change how he does things, which is to do it through those who are faithful to him. For there are no conditions. There's no if statements. It's just God declaring, this is what I will do through you. The only imperative, what's the only imperative? Class? Yeah, leave, go. Go, leave, leave behind the old ways. Stop this Eastern movement, turn and go West against the tide. Because, and this is the technical term for this is repentance. Turn from one way towards another, put one foot in front of the other and walk in obedience with me. Walk away from making a name for yourself. Walk away from the participation of self-destruction. Walk away from brother reaching out to kill brother. Come home, move west. Abram, he was a pagan. That's okay with God. He's gonna show himself slowly over time and reveal more and more about himself until we're ready for Jesus. We see hints of Jesus in the Old Testament, but is not until Jesus that we see the full and complete picture of who God is. This is where it's going. This is how all the promises are fulfilled in the person of Jesus. All the promises made to Abraham and all through the patriarchs in the Old Testament are full and complete in Jesus Christ himself. Abraham was imperfect. 
His knowledge wasn't perfect, but God told him to go west, and he went west. He started moving into God. That was enough. So, application. What does this mean for us? Well, when somebody is, is suffering, they're, they're lost, they're confused, they're in grief, they're hurting. My temptation is to offer some sort of platitude. I'll say something like, God's gonna work this for good, you'll see. That, that there's, like, my temptation is to explain things and as if God needs some defense and he's, he's on the witness stand and I'm the defense attorney and I'm, I'm coming to the witness and stand, I'm saying, listen, let me, let me defend God about what this, what's happening right here. And I don't know if you've ever had the experience where you've been genuinely hurting in a genuine crisis and somebody offers a platitude. And it's well-meaning and it's true in, in, in the sense that it's biblical. But the effect it has on you is the opposite of what was intended by those words. And it tends to push you away. Now imagine that that person sits next to you and when you explain why you're hurting, all they do is bear witness to your pain. And they say, instead of some platitude, they say something that doesn't feel like much to them, like, I'm so sorry. That's terrible. That must be really hard to walk through right now. And then you find in that moment that that's what I needed right now. I've learned that the hard way, pastoring people, saying the wrong thing too often, think I need to explain God, when all people need is for me to sit and bear witness to them. What this passage reminds us is how God reverses the course of history is through people being faithful to him. That the, Abraham's faithfulness to go is the beginning of the work of the ark of redemption. So if you've ever had the experience where somebody just simply bearing witness to your pain and suffering and sitting in that and they left and you had the sense that you've just been visited by God, that's Genesis 12. That is the promise of scripture that God does his work in and through ordinary pagans like you and me. That God, that, eh, let's retract that from the record. <laughs> we'll say ordinary people like you and me who believe that these small acts of obedience are how God does his activity. Let's pray. Father, this morning as we are reminded um, of Abraham and his life, that he was called to go. For all of us who are here who have this tug to leave something behind, to pursue you and where you're leading, may they draw encouragement from Abraham's story. And for all of us, may we recognize and acknowledge that you do your work in and through your faithful people that began, that began in Abraham, that continued uh, through Moses and, and the story of Israel all the way up until Jesus and, and Paul reminding us in the book of Galatians that we are your body, that we are how you act in and through the world. Lord, so may we learn from Abraham to be an abiding presence, to trust you and your promises, and to live faithfully to you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.
Well, happy Father's Day. Thank you. That's right. Receive now your benediction, which comes from Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, may we throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles that we can run with perseverance the race marked out for us. May we fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So may you consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Amen.